A lot of associate level students, like whether it's they're doing their CCNA or their JNCIA, they ask me, what's the purpose of a switch? I find this an interesting question because if you were to ask my oldest son, he's going to be thinking, well, the purpose of a Nintendo Switch is to play Smash Brothers. And if you're going to ask my youngest daughter, she's thinking on, off, on, off, where she's thinking of a light switch. But in regards to a network device, a network switch, well, what does it do? And at the most basic fundamental level, a network switch provides additional Ethernet ports for devices to connect to so that they communicate with each other and share information without having to disconnect every time. This is what we also call an unmanaged switch. If you think about it, most PCs or laptops, they only have like a single network interface card. But if you wanted to print a report from the network printer and then receive an email and then probably send a file to Charlie in accounting, then to print, you would have to connect to the network printer. Also, without a switch, only one person is going to be able to print at a time, yeah? Then disconnect to reconnect to the email server, then disconnect again to reconnect to Charlie's PC to do a file share, and then sit looking in Charlie's face while the file transfer is going across. Whereas, if you've got a switch, you could do all of these things at the same time. And as for a managed switch, it allows you to do all the things above, but also allows some, you know, a network administrator to do some funky stuff like port security and VLANs and um, start storm control, firewall filters, and lots of other stuff as well. If you're enjoying the content, please consider subscribing as 86% of viewers aren't currently subscribed. So with that being said, let's examine our layer two switching diagram. And what we have in our diagram here, we've got a Juniper VQFX switch utilizing the RE and the PFE. So you've got the routing engine, You've got the packet forwarding engine and connected to the switch, we have three users. Let's call them user A, user B and user C. They're going to be configured with the IP addresses of 192.168.0.11.12 and .13 respectively, all with a slash 24 subnet mask. Now, the switch interfaces are configured as access ports in the default VLAN, that's VLAN 1. When a device is first connected to the switch, switch knows nothing about that device at all so when the device sends a frame an ethernet frame the switch learns from looking in the ethernet header the source mac address and places this along with the interface it received it on in something called the bridge table now to actually forward that frame to the destination the switch again looks in its bridge table and if it doesn't have a mac entry then it's going to flood the frame out all of the interfaces within the same broadcast domain so within the same vlan apart from the interface that it received the frame on. And when that unknown destination responds to that flooding, then again, the switch going to, is going to look in that ethernet header, take the source, MAC address, and the incoming interface and populate its bridge table. And it's gonna keep repeating this process until it's got a full picture of the topology of all the connected devices that it has and eventually it's going to be able to not have to broadcast those frames it will have a forwarding table so an ethernet frame will come in and it will know which interface to send it out according to the mac address to get to the destination device all right so we're going to have a look at our network diagram this is our network diagram we have our qfx switch user a user b and user c user a has an IP address of 192.168.0.11, user B.12 and user C.13. Now I have our QFX switch here opened up and all I've got on it, it's got a default config, but I've put on the root authentication password and I've given it um, a host name just so that we could access the actual switch. All right, this, uh, that's some configuration I was doing before. Hopefully it won't affect anything. Well, if I do show interfaces XE001, we see that it has the default config of a layer 3 interface using DHCP. That's not going to be much use for us if we're doing a layer 2 switching lab. So we can change that. And if I look at the VLANs, we've got the default VLAN ID. What I've also done, I've gone on to user A user B and user C and giving them the IP addresses just so that they should be able to ping each other once we've done the layer two configuration. 
So let's get on with that configuration right now. If I say edit interfaces XE001.0 for the unit, um, I will delete this family inet. I could delete everything under that interface, but if you just wanted to delete the family inet and the configuration under that, you say delete family inet. Then I'm going to edit and make it a layer two switch port. So edit family ethernet switching. And this is gonna be an access port. So set interface mode as access and we're going to make it a member of VLAN 1, the default VLAN. So VLAN members and we just say default and we'll do the same for the other interfaces as well. So I can say top edit interface XE002.0 family ethernet switching and then I could just up arrow now this will cause us an issue because now you have um, this interface configured as a family INET and family ethernet switching. So if I was to do a commit check now, sorry, commit check, we'll see that it will fail. But if we just say up two here, oh, it was only up one. And then we say edit unit zero. And we say delete family INET then we were to do a commit check and that should succeed excellent and the last one we need to do the same thing for interface XE003 delete family INET and then edit family Ethernet switching, couple of up arrows, find the one that we're looking for, that's it, commit check. Now some people say that this commit check is a waste of time because when you do a commit it checks automatically but I like to see if there's any errors before I commit and let's say commit. I should have done a show compare actually to see the comparison, but it's a bit late for that now. We could do that on the next lab. And we're gonna check our Mac table to see if we're learning any Mac addresses. One show ethernet switching table. No Mac addresses at the moment. So let me jump on to user A and see if user A is able to ping user B or C. 192.168.0.11 that's its own address we should now see user A's MAC address in the MAC address table which we don't okay fair enough that's probably because it's local let's ping across the link pinging across the link now we should see definitely MAC um, user A's MAC address and user B, brilliant. Let's make this bigger. Do we need to be bigger than that still? Wow. And what this MAC address table tells us the VLAN members, so they're in the default VLAN, which is VLAN 1. This is the MAC address. The MAC address has been learnt dynamically and the interface that it's coming in on. The last one is to ping um, user C. And then again, we should see that MAC address in the MAC address table. And there we see user A, which is actually this one, according to our diagram, user C, user B, which is this bottom one, 
and user C, which is this top one. So that's all for our layer two switching lab. I'll see you in the next video. It's question time. Question one. What is the defining characteristic of an unmanaged switch? A. It offers plug and play functionality with no user configurable options. B. It provides advanced routing capabilities and QoS configuration. C. It supports remote management and has an extensive user interface. D. It allows dynamic creation and modification of VLANs. The answer is A. Unmanaged switches are designed for simplicity and ease of use, featuring plug-and-play functionality, but lacking advanced configuration options typically found in managed switches. Question 2. What is the primary purpose of the bridging table? A. It maintains a mapping of MAC addresses to interface ports, facilitating layer 2 forwarding decisions. B. It configures routing protocols for efficient data transmission between routers. C. It manages the allocation of IP addresses to devices connected to the switch. D. It controls the creation and modification of VLANs within the network. The answer is A. The bridging table, also known as the MAC address table, is used to store the association between MAC addresses and the interface ports on a switch. This mapping enables the switch to make informed decisions about where to forward frames based on their destination MAC addresses. Question 3. How is the process of flooding utilized for populating the bridging table in Layer 2 switching? A. It configures routers to dynamically update MAC address entries in the bridging table. B. It involves broadcasting frames with unknown destination MAC addresses to all ports in the network. C. It restricts the flow of broadcast frames to designated VLANs for efficient network management. D. It uses multicast to selectively forward frames based on specific MAC address ranges. The answer is B. Flooding in layer 2 switching occurs when a switch encounters a frame with an unknown destination MAC address in its bridging table. The switch then broadcasts the frame to all ports, except the one it was received on, to ensure that the frame reaches the intended device. To get the complete question banks for all the JNCISENT videos, drop us an email at info at